Amen. Good morning. Man, I love the one part up there that says God still tells his story through the lives of those who follow him in their faith life. Amen? Amen. It means you and I got a story, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to hear your stories sometime. I know a lot of your stories, but not all of them. Amen. Well, hey, I am glad you're here today. I know we got a few new faces, a couple returning faces. And so, again, we just want to welcome you here to Solid Rock Church. Uh, it's, uh, it's a group of folks that are just kind of seeking to draw together and walk a walk of faith to be able to let the Lord lead us in our lives. I hope that uh, if it is your first time, you should have had a yellow yellow card for, that you got at the front door. You can put that on the box on your table uh, and fill it out and put it in the box on your table and let us be able to send you a thanks for hanging out and visiting with us today. Amen? Amen. amen. So, hey, I was uh, recouping from COVID. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you, Lord Jesus. And so I am 199% sure, 199% sure. I'll have to figure out those odds a little later on. But uh, uh, in that, uh, uh, I'm sure I had the Omicron variation or variant. I would have not believed I had COVID if I didn't do a home test because I didn't feel that bad. And so that's, I just want to tell you my own testimony. Uh, and indeed, if I had that Omicron variation, uh, then I was very fortunate because some of the other COVID stuff is much more devastating and more di- difficult uh, to deal with and stuff. But truly for me, it was uh, a very, very mild case. So I'm very thankful to the Lord about that. Amen. Amen. So make sure and take care of yourself, whatever that means for you. And, uh, but uh, really, it was mainly being uh, uh, sequestered off into my bedroom was the hardest part because yeah. I didn't have anybody to visit with, man. <laughs> wanted to hang out and talk to my wife and stuff, so... Anyway, I appreciate you to your prayers and appreciate Jason's. How'd he do? Did Jason do okay last week? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, there's a few of you. I can see he slid a few of you a $20 bill to clap for him and stuff. So, But, uh, man, we, we're fortunate to be able to have someone be able to step up. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. So we're continuing a journey into the new year. I'm on a little sermon series just talking about New Year. I mean, it's culturally in America, we embrace this weird thing called the New Year, uh, and so there's some applications mentally, emotionally for us. And we've been in a season of looking that, you know, at the very first of the, uh, the new year, the sermon was have no fear into the new year. We, we talked about focusing on what was coming in the new year for us. Uh, and last week, Jason was kind enough to pick up some of my sermon outline. And he talked about gifts, God's gifts in the new year. The fact is, is that as we start not just a new year, but... In any one particular season in our lives, we really don't know what lies ahead for us, the details of our lives. And the truth is, is sooner or later, we're all going to face some difficulties, challenges, disappointments, and perhaps even tragedies. That's just real life stuff. It's my hope for you, it's my hope for me, that when those moments come into our lives, we will fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus And follow his steps, follow him as he leads us in our faith life. Our sermon title for today is called Start with Faith. And today as we talk about faith, walking in faith, we're going to use Joshua as our object lesson. We'll use Joshua as he is named the new leader of Israel and what that means for him and as it may reflect even into our own lives. Consider our sermon verse today, which comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Now the Lord here is speaking to Joshua, and the Lord says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, get up, and go over this Jordan, talking about the Jordan River. You and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, To the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give you, just as I promised to Moses. Wow, can you imagine being Joshua and hearing those words in that moment? You know, Joshua knew it was going to be hard to lead Israel. After all, Joshua had been a trusted um, servant directly to Moses as Moses led the nation of Israel. 
So all those times in Scripture that we read about when the Israelites were being knuckleheads and rebelling and whining and complaining, and Moses had to deal with all that, well, guess who's just watching all that happen? Joshua. He saw Moses suffer and leading this same group of people. But now the Lord has instructed him to become Moses' successor. And God is commanding Joshua to arise, get up, go over the Jordan River, and enter into the promised land. Moses never got to do that, did he? Moses was prevented from entering into the promised land and taking this group of people into the promised land. But Joshua was going to fulfill that expectation, that role, that promise. So today for our sermon, as we uh, talk and, and as we explore and, and look at our sermon title, starting with faith, we want to look at four fears. Four fears for my note takers. Four fears that Joshua faced in becoming the leader, leader of Israel. Four fears that maybe we can face in our own journey of faith at various times in our faith life. We want to explore how God met some of those fears and how we have the same assurance and presence of God in our lives that Joshua had in his. So number one for today, there was fear in even entering into the new land. The first fear was even entering into this new land. So remember that historically where we're at, now, right now, as is, is, is we're, we're kind of still in Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as we just read as our sermon verse, Israel is poised to go over the Jordan into the new land. So what's going on in their minds? Their best recollection, the thing that would be influencing them, would be twofold. One, Moses has just died, and we got this new guy named Joshua leading us, and we're not sure about him. But also very much on their mind was the previous reports that the Hebrew spies had made when they had previously spied out the land. Now you'll remember originally, and Moses sent spies into the land to be able to come back and give a report. And Joshua and Caleb, two of the spies, came back with positive reports. We can do it. We can follow the Lord and we can take on this land that God's promised us. But the other ten spies came with a negative report. And we see that reflected in Numbers chapter 13, verses 31-32. Now that that says, But the men who had gone up with him said, This is a negative report from ten of the twelve spies, uh, said, we are not able to go up against these people because they are stronger than we are. Then they presented the Israelites with a discouraging report of the land they had investigated, saying, the land that we pass through to investigate is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people we saw there were of great statue. Stature, I'm sorry. Great stature. Joshua also knew, beyond these negative reports, Joshua also knew the reality was that the enemies already in the land were well-trained and well-prepared for battle. Who were the Israelites? Slaves. Previously had been slaves. Born into slavery, had left slavery, and now they were basically, basically nomads. They had wandered around for 40 years. Because they didn't enter into the land the first time. They had no military preparation. See, Joshua was very clear on what the, the realities were, what the situation was, the circumstances were. The people already had a fear of the inhabitants of the land because of those earlier negative reports from the spies. And we should remember in our own lives that negative situations or experiences or reports can lead to fear that can paralyze people. Have you been fearful enough before you've been paralyzed into action? Have you been so overwhelmed at what the odds looked like in your family life and maybe your job circumstance and a move or uh, maybe losing a job and trying to find a job, and it seems like there's this tsunami of just 
negative things. Been there in my life. It's peril for me. It's paralyzing. I, Matt, I can't. I can't make a decision to go either way. And this is perhaps certainly what is plaguing Israel. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Brother Paul in the New Testament. You remember that Paul having had an experience of having an unidentified thorn in his side. It plagued him. It was a negative presence in his life. We see this reflected in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 9. So Paul now is speaking and writing in to the church at Corinth. says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. The unnamed thorn should leave me. But he, God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul goes on to say, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. There's a little thin lie that, that circulates in our faith life. And the thin lie is, is that if you want something in your life changed, you just got to be very sincere and pray really, really hard and name it and claim it, and God will change your circumstance. How's that working for you? Not working good for me because it's not true. See, God is sovereign. Bill is not sovereign. Amen? God will do as God wants to do with me. And that's part of what I said when I said, here I am, Lord. You take my life and you do with me as you want for your glory and for your kingdom work because it's not about me. And some in the faith life want it to be all about us. That we're going to name it and claim it and health and wealth and other cute little sayings that I can't remember right now. But somehow because we're God's people, we're promised perfect health. I'm just going to tell you, I believe that's a lie from the pit of hell. Because we're not promised perfect health. We're promised His presence in our lives. Now, I want to equally say, I am a person that believes that God still heals people physically, instantaneously, in some cases. Not every case. And somebody says, well, that's not fair. You know what? Based on human experience, that may not be fair. But I don't equate God with my human experience. God is sovereign. God's plans are not my plans. He knows more than I do. And it is me following him and trusting him. Do you know that Paul did his entire ministry dealing with this particular unidentified negative obstacle in his life? Now, we don't know if it was a physical malady. We don't know if it was. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, 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 thoughts on what the thorn in Paul's side may have been. We simply don't know exactly from the scriptures. But it was there for his entire ministry. And do you notice the words? Now, this, this is important. I want you to hear this again. And this is the last sentence here of the Scripture verse. Therefore, this is Paul speaking, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Paul wanted to make sure that if people saw any power in his ministry, it wasn't his power. It was the power of God in his ministry. Amen? So for you and I, what is that, what's that mean? Well, what that means is, is what we often will say here at Solid Rock Churches is that I'm called to be available and willing. I'm called to be present with the Lord saying, here I am, Lord. Where do you need me at, Lord? If, you're, if, you, if, you, if you've been an athlete before, in some form you go tell the coach, coach, what do you need? I, I'm here. You can put me in anywhere you need me. Here I am, Lord. So we're willing and available to him so that he can place us and use a willing heart in his kingdom work. How do we surrender, submit ourselves to him? Because it's my personal desire, I hope it's your desire, to not steal any glory from the Lord. You know, yeah, I mean, I know, I know. I mean, just just face it, Bob, I'm a good-looking guy. I get it. Who was somebody over there? I don't know who it was, but I'm going to find it. <laughs> don't we sometimes get a little focused on how 
knowledgeable I am in the scriptures. And, well, you know, I've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 90 years. But let's be careful not to steal any glory from God. Let's always be willing and available to allow him to use us. And it is my true belief that when we have a submitted heart to the Lord, that God will use us in some powerful ways. As we get back to Joshua, you know, God didn't change the giants in the land that the spies had seen. Just like he didn't remove Paul's thorn. But what did God ask both of those guys? In some form or fashion, God said, would you just trust me and follow me as we go into, in Paul's case, ministry, spreading the gospel in the first century, second century church? In Joshua's case, would you just follow me across this river as we go in and bring Israel into a new land? God asks his people to trust him and to go forward. Are you like me? You want all the answers before you take the step? Well, that looks like a scary step. I'm not sure I want to take that step until I know all the details about where that step's going to lead. That's just me sometimes. I don't know about you. But my real life experiences, very rarely do I, know, do I know much about where I'm stepping and often not much at all about where I'm stepping, but he still asks me to step there. How about you? Is God asking you to move in your life somewhere and some, through some fear, through some obstacle? How are you doing with moving forward in that fear into that new land, perhaps? <clears throat> Excuse me. Secondly, Joshua today Number two for my note takers, had some fears as the new leader. Fears as the new leader. I think about this sometimes. You know, so Joshua, what we know about Joshua before he becomes leader of Israel, is we know he was really faithful to Moses. He was a faithful companion, servant to serving the leader he was a worker bee guy. I like worker bee guys. Amen? I'd rather be a worker bee guy. I'd, I'd prefer to be behind the scenes because that's my natural, more natural gifting. And I love that about Joshua. But now God has said, arise. You, Joshua, arise and take these people across the river. He's stepping into that leadership role. Wow. I think that was overwhelming. It could be overwhelming just to think about. Joshua knew he wasn't as talented as Moses. Remember, Moses had been trained originally in Egypt as a son of the royal family. You remember the way that Pharaoh had embraced him. He was raised with the best education. He was sought out as a leader, as a young man early in Egypt. It gave him tools on how to work with people, how to lead people. Joshua didn't have any of that. Here's, here's Joshua's pedigree, born a slave under Pharaoh. That's his qualification. That's what gets him before the Lord, slave. And if God can work with Joshua, how much more can he work with you in your circumstance? We talked about that Joshua had seen firsthand the stubbornness and difficulties Moses had faced in leading these people. And so right after that bad report, you remember that bad report we talked about earlier from the spies that was given back to Moses and the people? We kind of see an example of Israel back from Numbers chapter 14, verse 2. So now the, the, the 12 spies had gone into the land. They came back, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, had a good report. Ten had a bad report. So after the, after the report, it says here in Numbers 14, 2, it says, All the Israelites murmured against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If we only had died in the land of Egypt, if only we had, or if only we had perished in this wilderness. Yeah. Uh, wah. Wah. Don't we sometimes think that about Israel in this season? Rebelling against the God. Rebelling against their leadership. Whenever it gets a tiny bit tough, they start, 
Wah! But let's not be too hard on Israel. Because when things get a little tough in my life, what do I do sometimes? Wah! It was an ongoing, consistent issue for Moses in leading the people out of captivity into freedom. They complained, and they whined, and even rebelled. You might read about Korah's uprising. Man, God was really displeased with that. So Joshua was very clear on how difficult this role was in stepping up as the new leader. And I could imagine for Joshua and his humanity, you demand, is what God says to Joshua, and I'm sure some fears came into Joshua's life. I thought a little bit about that. It reminded me a little bit of Ananias, whom the Lord sent to pray for Saul, the hater of Christians. You remember that story, right? I'm reading from Acts chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he, Ananias, replied, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at Judah's house look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. <laughs> man, I, I, just, I feel for Ananias in that moment. See, everybody, if you're a Christian, first century Christian, trying to get that very early church going, you knew who Saul of Tarsus was. He was not a friend of Jesus at that time. Saul, persecutor of Jesus' followers, killer of believers. And God asked Ananias to go and to pray for Brother Saul. A more detailed reading of that story in that portion of, of Acts reflects that Ananias had a fear in going to pray for Saul. Like Joshua, Ananias did what the Lord said. And Saul, who was in that house, who had been blinded unknown, un unknowingly to uh, Ananias, was now becoming Paul. And in that, after that prayer, his blindness was healed. He later becomes baptized, and he went on to be the primary voice of this new faith called the way. See, Ananias, like Joshua, didn't know the rest of the story. In the moment, he was asked to go faithfully by the Lord. So is God asking you today to step into something new? Has he got a new vision for you, a new journey for you? And I know some of your stories in here. And there's a, a couple of folks in this church that will be physically relocating to a different part of the state of Texas. There may be some fears in that. Amen? But that God's opened doors for people to go. I was picking on uh, Miss Betty a little earlier and stuff and talking about uh, a lady from New Jersey. And so, you know, Miss Betty came from New Jersey and there might have been some fears in that. But you know what? We're called to step into new things in our lives as the Lord lead us, leads us. There might be something different the Lord's asking. Well, you know, I've always done this, Pastor Bill. I get that, and I appreciate that you've been faithful to do whatever that is, but there's new seasons in life, amen? There's new things coming in life. And while I love everybody that comes to Solid Rock Church, and if you become a member here, I want you to be a member here forever, but the fact is no one's a member here forever, amen? We're all on a journey. We're all in different seasons. And our first loyalty is to the Lord. Are you fearful in stepping out into something new today. Number three for today. I want to look at the promises and assurances of God that God made to Joshua. Some promises and assurances as Joshua was facing this new leadership role. God made a promise to Joshua as the leader of Israel. And this comes from Joshua Chapter 1, verse 5, very famous scripture line, but hear it anew today for the first time. Now, God is personally communicating to Joshua, and he says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Does that warm your heart? 
That's the same promise you have from Jesus. Did you know that? Paul, in that beautiful uh, Romans chapter 8, towards the end, about ver- verse 39 or so, he's talking about, I am confident, I'm assured, that neither height nor depth nor kingdoms nor principalities, things above, things below, will separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's essentially the promise here. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Part of Joshua's new journey was to walk in faith as Moses had done. And he saw how Moses did it, didn't he? And here here is where, in my opinion, Joshua really overcame those fears. That in that moment that God tells him, I won't leave you nor forsake you. And that he, he had great clarity on who had sustained Moses. Because he watched Moses continue to be faithful, to continue to walk with the Lord. And the Lord continued to pour into him, even though this people was rebelling and being knuckleheads and whining and complaining. Moses moved forward under the hand of leadership and guidance and protection of the Lord. See, Joshua knew That the God who has sustained Moses in so many challenges was also going to sustain him. Church, that's that's our promise for today. The God who you've seen work in other people's lives. Maybe a faithful family member or a good dear friend. Maybe you've seen God do tremendous things in other churches or other people's lives. But God's prepared And wants to do that in your life today. Sustain you. Because you and I are also called to walk in faith, aren't we? Okay, clearly the volume must have cut out on that. We're called to walk in faith. Now, I can only tell you and I can only testify to my own personal life. But for me and my personal faith journey, very rarely... Do I have great clarity on where my journey is going exactly? Does that make sense? Is that I will know that the Lord is leading me in something and I'm going like, okay, um, could I have just a few more details here, Lord? And sometimes he goes, no. Mm. But that when I'm faithful to simply take a step. He's waiting there for me, and he continues to journey with me. We've seen several examples of our assurance that God is with us, walking with us, supporting us. John, the apostle, but was encouraging people in his letter when he said this in 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. Now, so John's speaking, he's speaking about God and God's commandments. There he says, and his commandments do not weigh us down because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. This is the conquering power that has conquered the world, our faith. Man. I mean, is that humble? Does it make you feel a little humble? Now, the truth is there are some blushes of the Christian uh, tradition. There are some churches that will take that statement that our faith, that the power lies in our faith. But I, I, I think that that's an incorrect interpretation of this. That the real power is the power of God, that when we submit to it and faithfully follow Him... His power conquers the world. Does that make sense? Because you can read this just on the face value. This is the conquering power that has conquered the world. Our faith. That our faith now becomes the object of power and authority instead of our submission to God and Him working through us becomes the power. Does that make, does it, does it make, that make sense to you? Because some people, if we start to think that our faith has power, 
then it's about my actions and my good works and what I do and what I decide. And then we stop listening to where he wants to take us and lead us. We start saying, here's the way I want to go. And we start to go this way and all of a sudden we're going like, well, nothing's working. There's no power in my life. Why is that? Because I have faith and I'm going this way and I'm doing all the right things. I'm doing the good works. But my, my faith's not changing anything. It's because your faith is in you, not in him. Does that make, does it make sense? This is a continual struggle in our faith life. And the message that's in crystal as a whole. Ooh, I went off on that. I'll, I'll get back to my notes here, okay? This is what our faith is based on. The power of God, not us. Your faith can't be based on you and your goodness and your, uh, your, your best understanding of the scriptures. Your faith life is not based on your good works. Your faith is not based on you. It's based on you and who you believe in. Does that make, I, I want to be clear on that. And I hope I am clear. And if you're not clear on that, you need to come see me. We saw earlier that Joshua was also assured of God's power. Remember Joshua 1, 5. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Forsake you. That is God's assurance in his life. Well, if God's got that assurance in Joshua's life, and we know that Jesus has left the Holy Spirit with us, then we have the assurance of God's presence in our lives to lead us, to direct us, to... To use us in powerful ways, yes, if we're submitted and humble ourselves to Him. Amen? The writer of Hebrews was teaching on God's provision and being content in the Lord when he said this in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is God speaking. The writer's talking about the words of God. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Now, as you look at the scripture, where's the focus of the man who hears that from God that I will never leave you nor forsake you? The focus is, is that God is my helper, not on me. Does that make sense? The Lord is my helper. I won't fear because God is present with me. What can man do to me? I mean, mankind, man, figuratively, individually, man could, I mean, could physically take my human life. Mankind, government could do that in some form. But my physicalness is not all of who I am, is it? It is God leading me and guiding me that, to do with me as he desires. It's my point today that we can rest and trust that God protects us and leads us in this new year, but not just the new year every day during the year, every day of our lives. So the message today, start with faith. Faith. And if you're here and perhaps you don't know anything about God, maybe you don't even like God, you hadn't trusted God, you think God's phony, fake, I want to encourage you to ask the question, I want, you to, I want to encourage you to consider this question. If God is really real, would you believe? Today, if you've never really believed in God, you've been uh, curious about God, you've been disappointed you feel like by God, your mom and dad want you to know about God, but you've been kind of holding off and keeping them at arm's length, I want to ask you the question. If God was really, really real, would you believe? And if you're in your heart of hearts, you say something to the effect that I'd like to believe, or yes, I think I could believe, then I want to encourage you. That's an element of faith. That's a slow glow of faith, and that the Lord would love to meet you in that encounter. And today, if you are a believer in Jesus and you're on your faith journey, I want to encourage you to continue the faith journey. Because I think sometimes we think that we've achieved a certain level of maturity, or we have achieved a certain level of maturity, and we stop saying, Woo! Man, I'm wore out. I'm going to rest here just a while. 
We'll make it a short while because our faith life is ever growing and developing. We don't arrive until we arrive home. Amen? God is still developing you and I today in our faith journey to do different things, new things, powerful things for Him that you may have never even considered before. And you can't get there if you're stopped in your faith journey. I want to encourage you to continue to go on. So as we do each Sunday here at Solid Rock Church, uh, we're going to go close in a time of prayer. Man, I love this time. This is the best part of the whole Sunday, at least in my opinion. Because my hope and desire is, is the Holy Spirit has moved and the Holy Spirit has kind of stirred some hearts. That the Holy Spirit is whispering, saying, hey, remember when we talked about this thing, whatever that might have been. may have nothing to do with having to do with Joshua or faith. But what is the Lord speaking to you right now? Maybe there's an element of fear that you've embraced in your life that you're having a hard time shaking. And we have a time now that we can, as individuals or in small groups even, go and pray and Ask the Lord to intervene in our lives, to heal us in a part of our lives, to open a door, or close a door, or whatever that may be for you. And I don't want you to miss that moment. What's the Lord prompting you to do or to move in today, right now? We just simply do that in a very informal way here. Uh, you can do that at your tables or side seating. Uh, you can pray individually. You can pray with a group. You're welcome to go across the room and pray for someone that maybe you feel led to go pray for. Maybe you'd like some prayer, but you're just not really sure on what that looks like or how that plays out. And Well, we've got some people. i got uh, Fred Pratt over here, one of our elders. Love to pray for you. And I see Mr. Cody back by the coffee bar, one of our young guys. Love to pray for you. And George is in the back to pray if you need somebody to pray for you. Miss Maria is there and available for a lady. If a lady would like some prayer, I'll be up here in the front and uh, available for prayer. And there's, you know, we're just available. I mean, we don't, you don't have to go to anybody to pray. And if you really feel like there's nothing for you to pray about, would you consider to allow the Spirit to move you towards someone to pray for them? That would be an act of obedience. Amen. And so we're going to just trust the Lord to move. And I don't know if it's Jordan or Matt or someone will come up and close us in a prayer. We'll have time to fellowship then. But let's hold off on the fellowship until we let the Holy Spirit move. Amen. I'm just going to ask you to stand and respond.